But friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want at the outset to say on behalf of the staff representing the General Synod of our Church and the Anglican Foundation of Canada a heartfelt thank you to you for the honor of being with you this morning as with great joy you come together to celebrate the dedication of your new church. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Father Sam. Thank you, good people of St. Michael and All Angels. You have an amazing story. You have a gem of a building, and you've got a future of grand possibilities in the service of Christ in this community. After a long and noble history, marked by steadfast witness to the gospel, a faithful ministry of word and sacrament, and a loving outreach into the community in which the former St. Michael and All Angels was set, it seems that there came a time when the Lord spoke as he has so often spoken in ages past, saying, I am about to do a new thing. Can you perceive it? Will you embrace it? Such times in the life of the church are soul-searching. They can be very unsettling, but they are also very exciting too. For somehow we know deep down that the Spirit of God, which always moves in mysterious ways or wonders to perform, she is hovering, calling us to embark on new ventures, the course of which is hardly known. Should we stay settled in a pattern of maintenance, or should we step out in faith, in nothing less than the assurance of the Lord's word to Joshua of old, as he stood at the edge of the promised land, be strong and of good courage, for I will be with you wherever you go. One could also think, it seems to me, about such a period in the life of a congregation as a time of visitation by angels. Those messengers of God say the scriptures who do the will of God. They arrive unannounced. And they startle us with some word from God. And as quickly as they've come, they're gone. And we're left feeling somewhat baffled. What was that all about? You want us to do what? How can that be? And so we begin our wrestling. Our wrestling with some crazy plan to pull up stakes where we are and go camp somewhere else. So begins our discernment of where and why that location or another. And it seems that when we get a bit tentative about it, all these angels, they show up again, bearing a word of encouragement, some gift of grace. And as we know from the scriptures, almost every angelic visitation is accompanied by this word from the angel. Don't be afraid. So we step out in faith as the pilgrim people of God and we move on. That is your story. And it's amazing what you've done. And while the record of this venture is duly recorded on shore, in minutes of parish council meetings and special meetings of the congregation in the last five years, between those lines are all these moments of divine visitation. In an article about church planting that appeared some years ago in a publication called the Anglican Theological Review, this is what the author wrote. Church planting is not for the faint of heart. It's for those who know that beyond the many months of discernment and that hour of the big decision are several years of concerted effort and resolve in staying the course. Such steering requires leadership, ordained and led, that is visionary and spirited, rallying the faithful, 
in the venture upon which they've embarked, with all its odds and all its opportunities. You've had that kind of leadership here. Such leadership sees the venture as a great evangelistic moment, a labor of love for the Lord and His eternal will that His church always be growing. This same article speaks of church planning as a work of faith and hope, grounded in prayer. Prayer not only for leaders, but for laborers. Those who lay the foundations and raise the walls and roof the place. All those who give cheerfully and generously of their substance to make all this work possible. And all those who pay attention to all the finishing details so as to bring the work to completion and readiness for its dedication to the glory of God. Yes, I'm talking about all those people you honored last evening. You have a gem of a building. A gem. So well placed in the community. As church planters say, location, location, location is all so important. Prominently placed at the very opening of a growing part of the city. It's well positioned for growth as young families establish themselves here in this community. Just look around. You've so tastefully incorporated old and new. All that was precious in the old church is housed here in the new one. Specifically, I think of the font, the lectern and pulpit and the altar. The font is in such a prominent place in this new church. A reminder every time we enter here that in the waters of baptism we've been brought to new life in Christ. We've been signed with his cross and we are a marked people. We are marked for ministry. And there, just as there's a diversity of ministries among the angels, so there's a diversity of ministries in this assembly. I love the fact that you've got clear glass windows around the font. Try and keep it that way. <laughs> because, you see, we can look out. We can look out to the community and be reminded that like the Lord himself, his church is to be in and for the world, for its healing, and for its peace. The lectern and the pulpit remind us that we're a people of the Word. The Word of God as we read it in the canon of the Old Testament and the New. The Word proclaimed, the Word interpreted, the Word sung, the Word danced in new and wonderful ways. Here the Word is going to be proclaimed for many years to come. In the spirit of the psalmist, the deeds of the Lord and the wonderful works he has done. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life and we who drink his cup bring life to others. There's in both this whole space a kind of holiness, not unlike that which Jacob perceived in his dream at Beersheba. In that dream there was a ladder set up from earth to heaven, or was it from heaven down to earth? And the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. And when Jacob woke from his sleep, he realized how awesome this place was. And he said, it is none other than the house of God and the very gate of heaven. In like manner, in like manner we know ourselves to be standing on holy ground. And that as Sam pointed out earlier, the angels are crowding the place. They're hovering about Ascending to God with our prayers and praises and descending from God with the blessings of God's goodness, mercy, and grace. Now, as much as we talk about angels, some of you may be saying, now just a minute, preacher. Do we really believe in angels? Do we really believe in angels? Well, they figure pretty prominently in the scriptures. In the stories of the patriarchs and the prophets, and certainly in the gospel of Jesus himself. Think how many times we hear about angels 
in the birth narrative, in the childhood narratives of Jesus. Think about how many hear about the angels being with Jesus in the wilderness and in the Garden of Gethsemane. The angels rolling back a stone and telling women who come to the tomb early in the morning, he's not here, he's risen. And think how Jesus talks about his coming again in glory, accompanied by legions, he says, of angels. Angels. Do we really believe in them? The liturgy of our church suggests that we do. And the liturgy of our church is an ancient liturgy. Going back to the earliest of times, we come to that moment in every Eucharist when someone, the presider, invites us all to join, as it says, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven and men and women who look to God and hope for hope in every generation to sing together that great song, the Sanctus. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Angels, do we really believe in them? The scriptures say we can. The liturgy says we do. While we may not see angels with wings unfurled, we are often, in fact, visited by angels. And we pray that they will guard and guide us. Something of the work of pastoral care for a congregation is wrapped up in all this. They come to us not so much in the way they're depicted in, in art or in greeting cards, but they come in quiet ways, unexpected. They're here, they're gone. An unexpected visit. A thinking, a thank, a thinking of you note, an email, a telephone call, a text, a word of encouragement or counsel that turns our situation around, words of invitation to just assess your attitude, rethink what we should be doing in this situation or that, might be in the form of a word of challenge, finally just a word about grand possibilities for the future here. The great 5th century teacher of the faith, St. Augustine of Hippo, wrote on the occasion of the dedication of the church these words. The work we see here, complete in this building, is physical. The stones and the beams fit together in an orderly plan, joined in perfect harmony, shall stand as witness and as symbol of God's grace. Here is one we claim the faith of Jesus. All are welcome. All are welcome. All are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where all are named, their songs and visions heard and loved and treasured, taught and claimed as words within the word. Built of tears and cries and laughter, prayers of faith and songs of grace, let this host proclaim from floor to rafter. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. What a great refrain. And what a great message for this community to send out to the wider community. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. So friends, grateful as we are, for all that has been in the amazing story of St. Michael and all angels, inspired by all that we see in this new church, this new facility for God's mission in St. John's, we are looking eagerly to the future. Our eye is on the horizon today. We look to the future in the confidence of the doxology we shall say at the end of this service. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.
Amen.